It took a moment for me to register the thing that hit my head was a paper airplane. Behind me, Rosemary was mouthing open it with great exaggeration, a sign not needed as she was the only girl I knew who was capable of such brashness, especially in Mr. Pemberton's science class. I looked up to make sure my infamously strict high school physics teacher was still facing the chalkboard. For the past 20 minutes, he had been scrawling all sorts of illustrations and equations, detailing a concept he called time dilation. According to him, it was a thing that was best observed in deep space, where supermassive black holes bend space-time to such a degree that time itself moves slower. It sounded like something I'd see in a sci-fi movie. Aside from this, I was unable to comprehend much of what was on the chalkboard. Simon would be having the time of his life. It was a wonder he'd missed school today. It was uncharacteristic. I hoped he was okay. Inside the paper airplane was a single sentence. We found something in the woods. I looked around at Rosemary, but she pretended not to see me. The ambiguity was clearly intentional. Annoyed, I wrote on the paper. Like what? And underlined the last word. Then, checking up front again, I passed it back to her. Like a normal person. The response I got simply read, Frozen Lightning. I was intrigued and considered responding but knew I knew I'd get nothing more. Rosemary was dramatic and liked to build suspense for the most mundane of discoveries. I tried to think abstractly, even humored the idea that frozen lightning was code for something else, like a junked motorcycle or a new type of plant she'd found to smoke. But in all honesty, I couldn't think of anything that made sense. I shot a confused scowl back at my friend but she was absorbed in her notebook, doodling cartoon characters. Thomas, since you seem so eager to pass notes, is there something you'd like to add? My head snapped forward, my heart beating a mile a minute. I glanced from Mr. Pemberton to the myriad of confusing mathematics. A dozen heads were turned my direction. No, sir. Not at all. Detention, then. After school, he began to erase the chalkboard in wide, sweeping strokes. You and the redhead. Detention didn't last long. Only ten minutes had passed by the time Mr. Pemberton left the room, muttering something about another cup of coffee. Rosemary was next to me, feet propped up on the desk ahead. A composition notebook slipped over her face to shield the light while she slept. I jabbed the soft end of a pencil into her arm. The notebook slid onto the ground and she stared around. Dazed. You got me in trouble, I said accusingly. This lightning thing better be good. Why don't you see for yourself? She said, hopping to her feet and crossing to the nearest window. She had it half open before I realized what was happening. What are you doing? I hissed. He's going to be back any second now. Then you better hurry, right? She nodded to the open doorway. He's going to wonder where I went. Besides, Simon's waiting on us. Casting one last cautionary glance over my shoulder, I grabbed my backpack and followed her out the window, hopping over a bush to reach the ground. We grabbed our bikes from the rack by the entrance, and we were off, gliding across the pavement as silently as sailboats. The smooth ground transitioned to cracked and later broken slabs of concrete as we neared the woods. Out here, at the edge of town, the sky was no longer bright and sunny, but roiling with the signs of a storm. Jagged gray clouds seemed to gravitate somewhere beyond the trees where I could no longer see them. Though it was dry, the air smelled strongly of rain. 
We left our bikes at the edge of the forest like we always did when we came out here to study or listen to music or pass the time by hitting pine cones with golf clubs. Simon must have found something particularly interesting if he had dared skip school to investigate it. He'd once given the entire class the flu because he couldn't afford to miss an exam. I followed Rosemary deep into the trees where it became increasingly dark as the storm clouds converged overhead. It was unusual for us to go this far, and I found myself wondering if I could find my way back on my own. The journey didn't seem to bother Rosemary. She just kept saying things like, I hope it's still there, and I hope no one else found it. I was just about to confront her on this cryptic manner of speaking, when she dashed ahead, up a small incline. This is it, she called back to me, and I struggled after her, calling for her to wait up. At the peak of the hill, she shielded her eyes from a light source just beyond the ridge. Whatever it was, must have been extremely bright, because she stood silhouetted against it, a holy white glow emanating around her body. It's here, she exclaimed, motioning for me to hurry up. I clambered after her, and when I finally glimpsed over the ridge, I too had to shield my eyes against a blinding white light. The storm clouds swirled around the origin of a single lightning strike, which scrawled its way toward the earth at sharp, meandering angles. Small tendrils of electricity wandered off, feeling the air, but for the most part, the beam was straight, aiming directly into the ground like a trident hurled by some ancient god. The thing about this lightning, though, was that there was no burst, no flash, and no roll of thunder. The strike appeared to be frozen in time, as though it was nothing more than a photograph. It touched earth in the center of a grassy clearing, surrounded on all sides by trees. Simon was down there too, and it was only his great hand gestures that broke me from my impossibly picturesque view. He was standing some distance away from the lightning, waving both arms and calling up to us. Check it out, Thomas. She's beautiful, isn't she? Come on down, the water's fine. Rosemary was already halfway down the slope. I followed her, nearly tripping over myself, unable to take my eyes off the thing ahead. Down in the clearing, even the air felt electrically charged, tugging at my hair and clothes like some great, static organism. What is this? I said, but the words escaped me as a hoarse whisper. Simon stood with his arms crossed, looking like a proud archaeologist who had just unearthed a tyrannosaur skeleton. Well, that's what we wondered too, when we found it. See, most people would be quick to ascribe something like this to the supernatural, but I think we're dealing with something completely natural. Maybe more natural than anything, even if we don't understand it. A space-time anomaly. A glitch in the Matrix, if you will. Rosemary waved her arms and wiggled her fingers for spooky emphasis. He won't shut up about his theories for this and that. Me, I think it's a sign of the end times, you know? End of the world stuff. Dragons, hellfire. Overhead, thunder rumbled in the heavens. The lightning was several meters away. My gaze trailed up the great length of it, admiring the blinding blue glow. The clouds were low enough that it would be impossible to see outside the woods. As far as we knew, we were the first people to discover it. Without us, it may never have been discovered at all. That's it, I said. No clues, no anything, just a frozen strike of lightning. Simon and Rosemary looked at one another. Well, actually, said Simon, 
there is something else too. Rosemary took a bright red apple from her backpack and chucked it overhand toward the lightning. The apple arced through the air, slowing immensely as it reached the beam, and at last came to a complete stop against the glowing white core. It blackened immediately, withering upon impact, frozen in time. I followed my friends toward the lightning, coming closer than I ever had. The grass around the impact zone was scorched, and small tufts of fire seemed to lick toward the sky in slow motion. The fire closest to the lightning appeared not to move at all. There's sort of a... radius, I suppose you could say, explained Simon. Overhead, the birds appeared to fly at triple the speed. Clouds slid through the sky like snakes. We're five feet back now. This is where I waited for you to get out of school. He held up a wristwatch which slid through hours like minutes. As you can see, for you it was hours, but for me it was no time at all. I watched the world around me appear to move in time lapse. A crow, which had flown so close to the lightning that it seemed to be frozen stiff, slowly gained movement. It exited the radius of influence and flapped drunkenly to the ground where it decayed immediately. Layers of its tiny body peeled back in seconds. First feathers, then skin, then muscle, until there was nothing left but a skeleton. It was all too much. I found myself stumbling away from the lightning, away from its weird time warp, falling to all fours and vomiting. When I was done, Simon and Rosemary helped me to my feet. You did good, time traveler, said Rosemary, wiping my face with my own shirt. That's longer than I lasted my first time. I've got to get home, I said. It's what? Six, seven o'clock now? I'm late for dinner and I skipped detention. My parents are going to kill me. They'll kill you now, said Simon. But what about a week from now? A month? Don't you understand, Thomas? If you go home today, you're the guy who got in trouble at school. Go home four months from now, and you're the missing kid who crawled back home after getting kidnapped. Zero consequences. I bet they'd give you anything, and you can have it all like that. Simon snapped his fingers. I said... So that's what this is all about, then? You want to be the missing kid on milk cartons because of some fantasy about returning home? It's more than that. You're thinking too small, said Simon. If two years pass while we're close to the source, we'll be legal adults. When we come back, we'll have proof of this. A scientific anomaly that Einstein himself wouldn't even dream of will be millionaires. Simon glanced back at the lightning, the hypnotic glow reflecting in his glasses. From a certain point of view, we already are. It's only a moment away. Simon started toward the lightning. As he did, his movement slowed immensely, appearing as though he were an astronaut on the moon. I chased after him, entering the field of time dilation. Around me, the world began to ramp up. The wind howled in my ears. The sun began to descend. I grabbed Simon's arm and spun him toward me. I can't let you do this, I shouted over the noise. You're going to throw years of your life away. For what? Money? Fame? It's a small price to pay said Simon, ripping his arm away and marching onward. A tiny, insignificant cost. Join me, Thomas. Join me in the lightning. The sun was well below the trees. Now it was night, and outside our small circle of light, there was only darkness. I couldn't stay here long. 
there was no telling how much time had passed already, and my parents were certainly aware I was missing. Panic welled in my chest, and in a last-ditch attempt to stop him, I lost control of myself. I lunged forward, grabbing Simon by the ankles. He went sprawling forward, clawing at the ground, kicking wildly with his feet. Get off, he screamed. Get off of me. This could be dangerous. I screamed back at him. I tried to pull him back, but he was dragging me forward into the influence. We were mere feet from the glowing core. Time passed so quickly here that the strength of the wind was nearly unbearable, battering us from all angles. The sky flickered rapidly as day and night passed in fractions of a second. The scenery in the clearing shifted colors as seasons passed, a pinwheel blur of greens and browns and oranges. Rosemary was with me too, pulling at Simon's clothes, but it was no use. He was back on his feet, one arm outstretched, moving toward the lightning core. Only something was wrong. I can't stop it! He shouted. His hand continued to move at a snail's pace toward the lightning beam. This close to the source. The time ramp was so exponential that distance between his hand and the rest of him was massive. The momentum of his open palm was already set. I wrapped my hands around his waist and pulled with all my might, but his arm might have been stuck in concrete. Rosemary yanked me back right as Simon's hand made contact with the core. There was a single, tortured scream as his skin blackened, frying to a crisp in an instant. It echoed across the clearing as we tumbled backward, out of the flickering chaos and into a cold, white expanse. Small flakes touched my face as I stared into an empty gray sky. Sitting up, I found myself waist-deep in snow that blanketed the ground in all directions. Also, it was night. I could just make out the snow-capped trees at the edge of the clearing, a stark contrast to the warm summer day I had hailed from only moments before. The lightning was still here, as bright as it had ever been, with Simon attached. Now he was nothing more than a charred black silhouette, frozen in time, one fist wrapped around the lightning core. I rolled onto my side and spotted Rosemary some distance away, sprawled brokenly in the snow. Crawling over to her, I saw that she was breathing, if only barely. I shook her awake and she sat up with a start turning nervously in all directions. It's okay, it's okay, I said, which wasn't true, but it's what came out. Where are we? said Rosemary. We're still here, I said, in the woods. That's not what I meant. Rosemary was looking at me with eyes round as quarters. Look around us, Thomas. Where are we? I swiveled, scanning the environment but it was hard to see in the blackness. My breath escaped me in visible clouds. I understood Rosemary perfectly fine, because she hadn't meant where we were, but when. There was no telling how much time had passed in that infinitesimal number of seconds we'd been close to the lightning strike. It could have been months. It could have been years. A small groan distracted the both of us. We only heard it because the ambient noise was now nothing at all. The silence of the night was near deafening. To my horror, I found that Simon was still alive. Maybe not living, but alive. His eyes, wide and miraculously intact, darted fearfully around, unable to communicate much else. The pain must have been unbearable, and there was no foreseeable way to rescue him. He must have been twenty feet away, and I wasn't about to risk fast-forwarding myself into oblivion. That close to the lightning, his being was captured so perfectly in time 
that even his own life was unable to end. Simon, Rosemary called, her voice breaking with emotion. Simon, we're going to get help. Rosemary started into the night, but I gripped her arm, tugging her back. She turned to face me, shocked and confused, tears staining her freckled cheeks. I'm afraid we can't leave, I said. Not until we know how much time has passed. It isn't safe. Rosemary wiped her eyes with the back of a hand. That doesn't make any sense. We have to get out of here. I sat down in the snow, hugging my knees against my chest. The cold was starting to eat at me, but I had a dreadful feeling we'd be here a while. I saw a bird, earlier today, minutes ago, or years. The absurdity escaped me in a humorless bark of laughter. I watched it decay, fast, too fast. It was unnatural the way it happened, peeling back like an onion. I didn't think much about it at first, considering all this stuff about time anomalies and frozen lightning. But I have a theory about the way time works here, and I don't think we can risk it. Rosemary let out a defeated sigh. She dropped to the ground next to me, holding her legs. If you're saying what I think you're saying, we're screwed. You know that, right? What if time has a way of catching up to you, I said, like a debt you have to pay. Spend a little here, spend a little there. But it accumulates, and eventually, I trailed off unsure of how to form the words. Sometimes you have a little debt, but more than enough to pay it off, said Rosemary hopefully. Sometimes you owe too much, I said, staring at the frozen core of lightning and the impossibly alive corpse that was bonded to it, more than you ever had at all. Dawn was just breaking by the time we got the fire to light. Trapped inside our bubble of exaggerated time, the sun rose quickly enough that it was well into the sky within minutes. We were at the edge of the lightning's jurisdiction, close enough to increase time, but not so far that we repaid our time debt, whatever amount that happened to be. The daylight did little to warm the air. Even Rosemary's blanket, which she kept in her backpack for particularly boring days at school, was thin and no match for the biting cold. The fire was our last bastion of hope, which we'd made out of a meager collection of sticks gathered from within our time bubble. There weren't many this far into the clearing, and we'd had to dig through the snow to find them. Rosemary had a lighter, and whether that was due to a series of questionable life choices or simply by chance was irrelevant to my relief. It had taken a while to light anything, particularly because everything we'd gathered was wet but eventually, she produced a spark. And here we were, in the morning of some unknown year, warming our hands. Do you think he gets cold? Asked Rosemary, glancing over her shoulder at Simon. I think he has bigger problems to worry about, I said. After getting cooked alive, I thought grimly, the weather was probably a relief. Besides, it doesn't really matter, does it? For him, this whole day will pass in a fraction of a second. I paused. Maybe the year? There you go again, Rosemary snapped. What does that mean? Thinking that we're off in some distant future. What if only six months have passed, Thomas? Your whole family could be out there worried sick about you. She pointed off to the side emphatically but it did nothing to help her point. Snow-capped trees bordered us in every direction, beyond which was a vague, threatening darkness. It was hard to believe that anyone was out there. Rosemary must have realized this, because she lowered her arm and said, this could be winter of the same year. I shook my head. It was wishful thinking, but it gave me an idea. 
I spilled the contents of my backpack into the snow, then ripped open the bag as far as it would reach. What are you doing? said Rosemary, calling for help. When I was a kid, my father taught me the universal smoke signal for SOS. At the time, we had been camping out in the Rockies and were in no danger whatsoever, but the concept stuck with me. Three smoke puffs, in quick succession, signaled an emergency. If the treetops blocked a view of the lightning strike to anyone in town, I doubted my smoke signal would be visible to anyone on ground, but a plane flying overhead would have the perfect view. The lightning, I figured, would certainly draw attention. I blocked the rising smoke with the backpack three times in a row, letting small gray puffs rise on their own above the trees. It was likely no one saw them, and I would be at it for a while, but for now it was our only option. I must have stood there for hours, blocking the smoke stream on and off until my arms were so tired I could no longer hold the backpack. Rosemary sent the smoke signals when I no longer could, but as I sat watching her, an anxious feeling began to nag at my throat, presumably due to the fact that I hadn't seen a single plane all day, and what I feared that implied. We took turns on and off, and by the time our arms were so weak they felt like spaghetti, it must have been mid-afternoon. The sun was on its descent, and the air was still miserably cold. Even the daylight had failed to melt the snow. At this rate, it simply accumulated. At night, the temperature would drop again, and we were running out of school textbooks to feed into the fire. We weren't prepared for another frigid night in the dark. At least, I wasn't. Rosemary must have felt the same way because she said it's going to get dark again soon. I'm not sure how much longer I can keep this fire going. And I don't think I can stand another night out here. Thomas. I looked up into the sky, where the lack of planes affirmed my suspicions that we were so advanced in time that human civilization no longer existed. So far, I had done a half-decent job keeping the thought at bay, but now it came out in full force, nauseatingly clear. Rosemary and I might have been the last people on Earth. It was a thought I'd have to come to terms with because leaving our time bubble almost certainly meant instant death. Rosemary shouldered a now mostly empty backpack and began to stamp out what was left of our fire. You know why we can't leave, I told her, but I made no effort to stop her. I didn't have the energy. We're not going to leave at all, she said. The opposite, actually. If you want out of this winter hellscape, the answer's been staring us in the face all day. It couldn't be more obvious. If you think a few hundred centuries have passed, what's another four months? If we're going to die out here, I'd at least like the weather to be nice. You don't get it, do you? I said, getting to my feet. We're not going to die. We're already dead. Haven't you noticed that you haven't been hungry all day? Or thirsty? Or tired? We've outlived our own lives, and the moment we step out of this clearing, it's going to catch up to us. And even if we aren't already dead, aging us forward another four months is going to make things worse. Either we're already dead, or we aren't, said Rosemary. If the difference between my life and death is four months from now, we just had the worst luck ending up here. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, really, what are the odds? I clenched my jaw. She had a point. If I was meant to die within the next four months, then this current winter was toward the end of my life anyway. If my theory was correct that thousands of years had passed, another four months would make no difference at all. I was dead anyway, and had been for several millennia. In any case, the fire was gone, and the numbness in my limbs was creeping into my face and body. Another four months would pass in the blink of an eye, and the temptation of spring was near intoxicating. I didn't have to tell Rosemary I agreed. She already had her back to me, 
and was marching full speed ahead toward the lightning core and Simon's blackened form. Only it wasn't full speed ahead, not really, because the further she got from me, the more she slowed. I chased after her and we both stopped in our tracks about three feet from the lightning. The sky began to blink as the day-night cycle increased exponentially, and the snow beneath us began to melt. Within minutes, the snow had been reduced to puddles, and then there was only dry, green grass. Indian paintbrushes, vibrant in color, sprang up from the earth as the cold gray sky opened itself to cloudless blue. Rosemary tugged on my arm, and we found ourselves hurrying out of the time warp into a time of year that promised summer was on the way. I put out an arm to stop her when I was certain time was moving only slightly too fast, so as to ensure we didn't exit the lightning's influence. My skin was still cold to the touch, but I could feel the warmth here thawing my flesh. It felt good. To us, the weather had completely changed in the span of five minutes. Behind us, Simon was still standing by the lightning. One fist closed around its core. I must have lost a track of time. Ironic, considering all the temporal anomalies we'd experienced while stuck in the clearing. Logically, I should have been hyper aware of how many days were passing. But ultimately, it didn't matter. Rosemary had done a good job keeping track at first drawing tallies in her composition notebook. But eventually, even she left it in her backpack, and it never saw the light of day again. All I knew was that it had been several days, or weeks, since we'd fast-forwarded ourselves into spring. Even the weather was changing, the days becoming longer and hotter, though never so hot that it was uncomfortable. It was picnic weather, and even though Rosemary and I never felt the urge to eat, nor did we have any food, we often found ourselves sprawled on the grass, counting stars or telling stories, or else spotting shapes in the clouds. Life within the lightning's radius had a dreamy quality to it, and although this might have been due to the slightly sped-up world around us, I imagined it had more to do with a loss of direction. We didn't know what time we were in, and because of that, we were in no time in particular. Without meals or sleep, even my own internal clock had ceased to function. There was only the present moment. If we ever get out of here, Rosemary postulated one day on her back, both arms behind her head, I'll never take my life for granted again. I'll live each moment like it's my last. Mark my words. Oh yeah? I said, lying next to her. Yeah, she said. But lately I've been thinking a lot about Simon. I mean, ultimately he's lived his last moment, right? Even if he appears frozen in time to us. If he stands there, holding that lightning strike potentially forever, it will pass for him in the blink of an eye. Won't it? For him... It already has. In a manner of speaking, one could say the moment he touched it, he found out what happens at the very end. The end of what? I asked. Rosemary rolled over to look me in the eyes. The end of time, she said. I was reminded of Schrodinger's cat, another physics concept I'd learned in Mr. Pemberton's class. In order to illustrate the strange behavior of quantum particles, Erwin Schrödinger had once likened them to a cat placed in a covered box with a radioactive substance. Without knowing the state of the cat, it could be thought of as being both alive and dead simultaneously, even if the reality was unknowable and contradictory. So it was with Simon, I supposed, in his last moment here, alive for the rest of eternity, yet dead the moment he touched the lightning his last moment captured like a snapshot in time. After that, Rosemary decided the most appropriate send-off for Simon 
while technically not dead, was to comfort him on his journey to eternity. No longer needing the blanket in her backpack, it was best to leave it with Simon lest it provide some modicum of comfort in his infinitesimal last moment alive. She promised two things. First, that she wouldn't get so close that an exorbitant amount of time passed, and second, that she would allow no contact between her and Simon that would allow the lightning's current to reach her. I watched Rosemary step toward Simon's body, and slow exponentially as she did, stopping a few feet away from him. For the next 24 hours, I watched as Rosemary cast the blanket over Simon's shoulders, then began her return journey back toward me. From her perspective, the action had lasted less than a minute, Meanwhile, I had spent the time wondering what might happen if we were stuck here forever. I had an entire night cycle to reflect on it. By morning, I decided I couldn't go on, not knowing what was out there. I was beginning to forget my family, my sense of self, my entire life outside of the lightning. An eternal life out here wasn't worth living, and in another several years... Who knew what I would remember? Who I would be? I had to know what the world was like, even if it was the end of me. In that moment, I gave up looking for a sign of outside life. As it turned out, I didn't have to. In the sky was a plane, so tiny from my perspective that I'd nearly missed it. It wasn't some futuristic plane like I might have expected. By the looks of it, it was a commercial airliner. Not much different from the ones in my time. I jumped up and down, waving my arms. The people inside wouldn't see me, but that was okay, because now there was hope. Hope that not much time had passed at all. Could we have been out here mere months? At most. Was my family somewhere out there, thinking of me? There was only one way to find out. And it involved getting out of here. When Rosemary at last emerged from her slowed-down reality, I told her about the airplane. I was eager to leave immediately, even grabbed her wrist and started to run, but was jerked to a stop. Rosemary wasn't moving. In fact, the look on her face wasn't relief at all, but one of distant melancholy. What are you waiting for? I said. Let's get out of here together. Thomas, she soothed. I've made up my mind. I'm not leaving this place. Even if I did, I can hardly remember who I am anymore. Or who I was. All this time, stuff has addled my brain so much that I don't know up from down. Simon needs someone here with him. Even if all of this is his last moment, I don't want him to be alone. No, I said, my voice choking in my throat. Please don't say that. Rosemary, when we first found the lightning strike, I thought it might be a sign of the end times. Maybe that isn't true, but that's what I wanted it to be. And that's where Simon is right now. He stood closer to the lightning than anyone, and all of time has passed him in the blink of an eye. Don't you see, Thomas? She stepped closer. The electrical shock may have killed him, but in his last moment, Simon found out what happens at the very edge of eternity. Please don't go. I begged her, taking both of her hands. I was vaguely aware that tears were streaming down my cheeks. Rosemary, this place is affecting you. Please don't make me do this alone. Rosemary leaned in and gave me a long, tight hug. Goodbye, Thomas. I couldn't have made it this far without you. If my family is still out there, Tell them I love them very much. I'll always be here if you need me. But I have to know what happens. I have to know what happens at the end of time itself. 
her hands pulled away from mine, and then she was walking away towards Simon and the lightning strike. Stop, I called after her. Don't do this. We can be free. She was moving in slow motion. In another several minutes, she was mere inches from the lightning's core, completely motionless. She and Simon might have been statues, untouched for years. Suddenly, I was left completely alone, sobbing in a forest clearing. I don't know how long I stood there, watching my two friends, hoping that one of them would come walking, impossibly, back toward me. Eventually, I decided there was nothing left for me here. I faced the wall of trees, my thoughts turning to who or what might be alive out there. Then, I marched into the wilderness. The trek back was longer than I remembered it. I thought I knew the way back, but the environment had changed. The path was weedy and overgrown after years of disuse. The trees had become so thick that the sunlight was almost completely blocked. The longer I walked, the more uncertain I became of how much time had passed after all. The important thing was that I was still alive so far. In any case, I hadn't completely disintegrated like that unfortunate bird I'd watched so long ago. That wasn't to say I was the same. As I stared at my hands, I felt certain they were wrinkling. I could feel my skin beginning to loosen, pulling at my arms and legs. My face began to prickle, a sensation I had little experience with as a high school kid. Soon, my joints became so gnarled and ridden with pain that even walking became difficult. I considered turning around trying to salvage what was left of my deteriorating life. Yet I carried on. Perhaps due to the prospect of finding civilization again, or just plain curiosity of what was beyond the forest. As it turned out, my town was still here. But it was changed. The first thing I noticed was that our bikes were no longer by the entrance to the forest. They were completely gone, vanished into thin air. The street was still here, noticeably more deteriorated than it had been when we arrived. Further out, there were still houses, notably more houses than there previously had been. I took a step into the street, but my right knee gave out. It was unexpected, and when I stood, my back ached with a sensation I'd never felt. I trudged on through the streets, passing things like homes and stores I'd never seen. The world seemed brighter, more colorful than it had been, yet somehow more cold. I stood on a street corner, holding out my thumb as a truck passed, but it continued on without even slowing. It was a familiar vehicle with an alien design. The only question in my mind was whether I currently existed within my own lifetime. I would know soon enough, whether I wanted to or not. I found my house exactly where it should be, and my heart skipped a beat. I hobbled through the lawn, so quickly that my limbs ached and I fell again, and when I reached the front door, I found it unlocked. On the outside, the house looked relatively similar to the way I'd left it. Inside, however, it was different. The furniture was different. The wall color was different. A device, presumably a television, was flat and large and black. I stared in wonder at the place, so long in fact that I forgot to call for my family. It turned out I didn't have to. A woman entered the room, but I didn't recognize her. She was of a different ethnicity than myself, and upon noticing me, her face contorted in a look of terror. Who are you? She demanded. What are you doing here? I started to say something, but no words would come out. 
I simply stammered, my voice caught in my throat. The woman rushed into the open kitchen area and grabbed a steak knife, aiming it at me like a weapon. What do you want? She yelled. You want money? I waved my hands defensively, but they were weak and shaking and in pain. The onset of arthritis. A man burst into the room, startled by the noise. What's wrong? He said to the woman. Then his gaze followed the aim of the knife to me. Get out. Now, he said warningly marching toward me and pointing to the door. I said, get out. He shoved me backwards so hard that I fell through the doorway and reeled back into the yard, crawling backward on my hands. I thought the man would come after me, but he simply slammed the door shut between us. I heard the sound of a deadbolt locking aggressively from the other side. Before I could stop myself, I was crawling back to the front door and pounding on it with both fists, calling helplessly for my parents. I only stopped when I realized my voice was deeper, more gruff. It wasn't the same voice I'd used only minutes before to speak my last words to Rosemary. Getting to my feet, I limped pathetically back into the street and began to wander about the town. It was still small, if slightly expanded to accommodate more houses. Main Street led me downtown, where there were stores and restaurants and offices I recognized. And then there were some I'd never seen. Passing by a storefront, I caught sight of my reflection for the first time since I'd emerged from the woods. I was no longer the high school kid I'd been back in 1965. And I was old, my hair graying my skin sagging in loose flaps from my arms. My face was deeply lined and splotchy with age. I was so gaunt, so emaciated and hunched, that the clothes that had fit me earlier today hung from my body with great slack. I wondered how much time had passed that I looked like this. The answer came in the form of a newspaper. I found one trashed in a garbage can, soiled with muck, the year printed on it was clear and unforgiving, 2022. In the span of a single day, I had aged forward 57 years. In my head, I calculated that I must now be 73 years old, my entire life gone by in an instant. That wasn't what worried me. I couldn't change the past, but with the world around me in a new era, it seemed my absence had left an empty space, one that had swollen shut while I was away. The hardest part of adapting to modern life was mourning the deaths of my parents, whose graves I found in an old cemetery on the outskirts of town. They were buried next to each other, though tragically they had died knowing their missing son had never been recovered. Presumed dead, I would imagine. Unbeknownst to them, the dead son they had once mourned was now mourning them. The grief was more difficult while having to fend for myself. I was eventually pulled off the streets by a group of altruistic Good Samaritans who gave me shelter in a place with other people like myself, homeless ghosts who had nowhere else to go. Regardless of the circumstances, I was grateful to be given three square meals a day and medical treatment for my worsening arthritis. Eventually, I went looking for a job, which proved easier said than done due to my age and technological naivety. I was introduced to the internet, a concept that was beyond my comprehension, but I found utterly fascinating. And then there was the laptop I'd been given, which allowed me to practice writing electronically. Sometimes, though, I put away the laptop and slip away from the shelter to take a stroll through the woods. It takes a while with how slow I've become, but eventually I reach a great hill and spot a frozen lightning strike just beyond, the two people at its base as still as they ever have been. It takes me a while to hike into the clearing, 
But when I do, I'm never disappointed by the peacefulness of this unchanging anomaly. My old high school friends are just as youthful as I remember them, standing side by side near the lightning strike. And sometimes, if I look closely into Rosemary's eyes, I catch the briefest glimpse of a cosmos swirling within them. I think it's the reflection of infinity. <laughs>